Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Oreskes and Reads. It is time for the next installment of my recent read series where I wrap up the last five books that I have read. So today we are wrapping up books 26 through 30. I feel like it's been a minute since I've done a recent reads video and I think that's because my reading in March has been a little bit slower than the past couple of months. For, the, for about four days in early March I wasn't able to read at all because I was at or preparing for a work conference and then some of the books have just been on the longer side and I've been taking my time reading them. So I think it's been like mm, two or three weeks now since I posted my last recent reads so, but yet I only just now finished like the fifth book that I could actually talk about. So reading is going a little bit slower in March but I do think I am still going to be able to complete the TBR that I set for myself in March. We'll see. We still have a few days left to go so anything is possible. But we are just going to go ahead and and jump right in with the reviews. The first book that I have to talk to you about today is Missing Pieces by Heather Gutenkopf. This was a book that I pulled to satisfy a challenge prompt for the month of March. This is a suspense thriller by Heather Gutenkopf. That is what she primarily writes. I have read two other books by hers previously and this was different in the fact that this was only told from one perspective. In my past experience with Heather Gutenkopf, her books have been told over multiple perspectives, often with at least two different timelines and she kind of weaves all of that together very creatively. But this was just told from one perspective. That is not a criticism and that is not a praise. That is just something that I noticed while I was reading this. So the main protagonist of the story, the person that is telling the story is Sarah Quinlan, but this is really following a lot of the events surrounding her husband, Jack Quinlan, because when Jack was just 15 years old, so 30 years prior to the start of the story, he and his sister Amy experienced a tragedy that no children should ever have to experience, and that is the loss of their parents in a very tragic way. And after Jack and Amy lost their parents, they were taken in by their aunt and uncle, and as soon as Jack was able to leave his small town, I believe it was in Iowa, as soon as he was able Able to leave his small Iowa town, he did and he has never gone back. So his wife Sarah has not even met a lot of his family, has not met the people that he grew up with, has not gone to his hometown or anything of that nature. But when Jack receives a call that his aunt Julia, the woman that took him and his sister in, has fallen down the stairs and is critically injured and might not make it, he definitely has to return to his hometown and he brings Sarah with him. And it doesn't take long for Sarah to realize that there are some things that are not right and she starts to uncover that Jack has been lying to her about very serious things including how his parents died. And so naturally that doesn't sit well with Sarah. And so while Jack is trying to deal with the family crisis that is happening, Sarah decides that she is going to figure out what actually happened to Jack's parents and she's going to try to uncover all of the lies that Jack has been telling her. And while all of this is happening, some suspicious things come to light about Julia, the aunt's fall, and Sarah starts to uncover that maybe Julia's accident is also related to the death of Jack's parents. And so this is about her and her investigation. Overall, I felt like this was a very positive reading experience. This is what I would deem a popcorn thriller. I use that term a lot, but a popcorn thriller to me is just a delicious, easily consumable read. It's a bingeable read. It's one that you just want to keep turning the pages for. You just want to know what happens. It's not necessarily anything that you have to think too hard about. So overall, I really enjoyed this book from start to finish. I was invested in it. I will say that it did take me a little while to get into the story, not because of anything related to the book, but because of the audiobook narrator. She was a very, for lack of a better term, harsh narrator. I can't explain that any better, but her voice was just very sharp and it took me a minute to get past it. I actually thought that I wasn't going to be able to listen to this because I was not enjoying the audiobook narrator, but I was able to kind of get past it and get into the story. And once I was in it, I was in it and I was able to get used to the narrator and everything like that and just focus solely on the story. I think on Goodreads, I gave this a four stars, but I think I'm going to actually like downgrade it a little bit to a 3.5 just for the memorability factor. Like I said, this was a very strong and positive reading experience. And for the most part, I remember a lot of the plot points. I definitely remember the who done it and the why and things of that nature, but I don't necessarily feel like this has a for everlasting capability. I did want to mention one thing about this book. I'm not going to go into any specific spoilers, but I'm going to give you some kind of context about this book that would probably help you determine who the killer actually is in this story. So if you don't want to risk any type of spoiler whatsoever for this book, I recommend that you wait until I have put the book down. And the reason why I want to mention this is just because it's something that I do see in a lot of thrillers. And if you consume a lot of thrillers like I do, this is something that you are going to probably have noticed as well. So something that I say a lot when I'm reviewing a thriller is that when you have a limited cast of characters you can never really truly be surprised by the whodunit because you know it's always going to be somebody in that small character group right because no suspense thriller author worth their salt is going to make the who in the whodunit some random person that you had never met before in the entirety of the book
book or if there had been no clues leading up to this person, right? A good suspense thriller author is going to leave crumbs for you throughout the book so that when you get to the whodunit, even if you had not been expecting it at all, you're going to be able to look back and you're going to be able to piece some things together and it's going to make a little bit of sense to you. So if you're reading a thriller suspense book and there's a limited cast of characters, one of those people is going to be guilty and you're never going to be able to really be surprised by that. But what it's really about is the journey and how you get there. Another thing that suspense thriller authors like to do is within these small groups of characters, they like to focus heavily on a couple of those characters and then not focus at all on one or two of them. And then you know it's one of those one or two, right? Because those are the least suspicious. Those are the most innocent characters. And if the author is not focusing on them, then obviously they can't be guilty. That is what this author did. And so as I was reading, I was paying attention to who was getting the most focus in this story and who wasn't being really focused upon at all. But yet the character was still considered important to the story. And if you have a character that's there, but not really there, like they're just kind of there for no real purpose, you're almost guaranteed to have figured out the whodunit. For me, it was almost easily predictable. I very much predicted it by the end. I didn't necessarily predict the why or how it was all going to come together, but I did predict the whodunit in this story. So in that way, it was a little bit predictable, but from start to finish, I found this an overall enjoyable reading experience. Like I said, I'm going to give it about a 3.5 stars and I'm absolutely going to be reading Heather Gutenkopf in the future because for the most part, I really enjoy my time with her books. This next book was not originally part of my March TBR, but it was sent to me as part of the monthly gifting group that I'm a part of on Facebook. This was the gift that I received and I'm so thankful that I got it and that I read it because it is definitely one of the hidden gems. I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did and it is definitely one of my favorites so far of 2023 and that is the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. I read the Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. I think it was late last year and I really overall enjoyed my reading experience of that. It was a lot of fun. Grady Hendrix has this really remarkable talent of writing horror novels that has just the right amount of humor, the right amount of cliche, the right amount of cheesiness about it, but yet is able to make it incredibly serious and in some ways gruesome. There were a lot of really interesting, gruesome, and graphic scenes in this story, and there were also some really harder hitting elements to the story too, like suicide attempts and things of that nature. But yet there's still so much humor wrapped up in this, and I don't know how he does it, but there is just such an amazing balance within his stories that I really, really appreciate, and it makes me really really want to continue with him as an author because I just love the whole vibe of his story. So this book is really about what it says in the title of the story. This is about a group of women. I think it's five or six women. They live in Charleston, South Carolina, and they have a book club. And this book club is primarily focused around reading really gruesome books, primarily true crime. So they're reading some of the classics like Helter Skelter, The Stranger Beside Me, and things like that. And then they'll scatter some other books in between, but they are really into true crime, which I, of course, can't appreciate as a true crime lover myself. And for the most part, all of these women lead rather like simple, quiet lives. A lot of them are housewives who spend their days taking care of their husbands and their families. And you know, nothing really exciting is happening to them or in their town or anything like that. But then a stranger moves into the neighborhood. His name is James Harris and he is there taking care of his ailing aunt who is one of the neighbors there that lives near all of the women. And after he moves in, really strange things start to occur. And that's kind of where we get into the very graphic and gruesome, some body horror scenes in here as well. Then one day Patricia, who is the main character in this story, she's the perspective that we read from throughout the entirety of the story. She witnesses something that she can't explain. It is something that James Harris is doing and she is positive that he is behind the disappearances of children that have been happening primarily in like poor black communities. Children are going missing or unusual things are happening to children where they're like actually committing suicide. They're becoming very unusual, very sick, and then eventually they take their own lives, which of course is just, it's just not done, right? You don't normally see eight-year-olds taking their own lives. And Patricia is convinced that James Harris is behind this, but nobody believes her. So you're kind of following her journey as she is trying to explain to everybody that James Harris is behind this. Nobody is supporting her. And then things kind of go on as normal until something happens and then everybody starts to believe her, right? And then these women need to take it upon themselves to eliminate the threat that is in their neighborhood. And I just enjoyed this immensely. I gave this a 4.5 stars because when I was done with this story, I couldn't stop thinking about this story. It was just so amazingly engaging and captivating. And like I said, it was funny. It was charming. It was action packed at points. It was very weird at points as well. It just had a little bit of everything and I very much enjoyed my reading experience of this. And this book was so many things. You know, it was a horror novel, but it was also a novel about really strong friendships. It was also kind of an ode to housewives and stay-at-home moms. This book was weirdly feminist in a lot of ways and it focused on the never-ending responsibilities of women and how underappreciated we can be. And there was definitely an emphasis on female strength and autonomy in this book, which I also really appreciated. So again, this was just phenomenal. I really enjoyed this overall and I 
am super excited to read more from Grady Hendrix in the future. I do also now have How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix, which was also sent to me as part of that gifting group, and I will absolutely be reading it probably for Slayer Fest in the coming months. So I absolutely love this, and like I said, I gave it a 4.5 stars. Next, I have The Passengers by John Mars. This was definitely part of my March TBR because I selected John Mars as part of the challenge prompts that I wanted to satisfy because he's an author that I wanted to read in 2023, and boy, am I glad that I did. This was phenomenal, and I don't know if it has ever been made into a movie, but it needs to be because this is a book that would translate so well to screen, in my opinion. So this book is set, if not in modern times, in a very near future. So it's not like a crazy, super futuristic sci-fi book or anything like that. It is very, very much like a present day, very near future type of story. But in this world, self-driving cars are the norm. In fact, normal cars that have to be driven by people are basically outlawed because in this day and age, it is thought that these self-driving cars are a lot safer. There are a lot less accidents. There is definitely no traffic. It is thought to be the superior method of travel. And it's basically the norm. People are starting to trust them. It is just the way of life in this world. And part of that way of life actually includes a jury of people who are there to review fatality accidents that involve these self-driving cars. So if a self-driving car is involved in a car accident that takes the life of a person, a jury of people get together to determine whether it was the car's fault, whether it was the passenger within the car, or whether it was some outside force. Like perhaps it was the victim's fault that there was the accident in the first place. And this jury is typically made up of a handful of experts who are always on the jury, as well as one citizen that gets randomly called in for jury duty like we do today within courtrooms and things like that. And I mentioned that aspect because one of the character perspectives that we get in here is Libby and she has actually been called to serve on this jury for a week. But unbeknownst to her and the other members of the jury, their time is going to be taken up by something rather special because on the day that this book is set, a hacker has actually hacked the self-driving cars of six particular people. He has a reason for why these people were chosen. All of the people in question have secrets. They are hiding things. And he has basically said that all of these people are going to be headed to the same direction. They are literally headed on a collision course and all of them will die. And there is an entire reason why this hacker has decided to hack AI cars. And there's also a reason why the hacker decided to do this while Libby was on the jury. So you're following Libby's perspective as she is a member of the jury, but you're also following the perspectives of the six members of the other cars. And you're getting a lot of their background, what they are hiding, why they are hiding it and things of that nature. So this was definitely a very fast paced plot driven story, but at the same time, it was also very character driven because while there were a lot of characters to keep track of, you definitely get a lot of each character. You understand who they are as people. You understand the secrets. Do you emotionally connect to them? Not necessarily. I wouldn't say that this is a book that you emotionally connect to because like I said, it is very fast paced. It is quick. It is page turning. It is plot driven, but you get enough of the characters to where you feel like you know them. And like I said, you get all of their perspectives. And if you listen to the audiobook, this actually has a full cast of characters. So each character has their own audiobook narrator and throughout the story also interspersed are like news clippings and things of what is currently happening in real time as these hackers are invading these cars and basically threatening to kill all of these people. And you find out why the hacker is so against AI cars, what the message is, what the meaning is. And this book really, really makes you think. This really makes you think about the value that we place on certain people's lives over others, who deserves to live, who deserves to die. The hacker makes the jury and the public answer these questions. And I just thought it was phenomenal. I was hooked from start to finish. I am sold on John Mars. Like I said, he was an author that I wanted to try in 2023 and I will absolutely be reading more from him in the future because this was fantastic. So if you have never read John Mars or if you haven't read this one by John Mars, I highly recommend because this was a great ride. See what I did there? A great ride. Yeah, that's what this was. A great ride. All right, y'all. And then next, I finally, finally finished Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. This is the third and final book in his Nevernight Chronicles series, which is one of my favorite fantasy series or even just series in general of all time. I obviously can't really say much about this book in particular because it is the third and final book in a trilogy. But if you're not familiar, this book follows our main character, Mia Corberry, who is an assassin. When she was just 10 years old, she watched her father be hung for treason. Her mother and baby brother were basically taken away and her mother was imprisoned and she thought her brother was dead this whole time and she was actually sent off to be killed, but luckily she escaped. She survived. And she ends up being taken in by a man named Mercurio, who used to be a member of the Red Church, which is basically an organization of assassins. And Mercurio recognizes in Mia the need for vengeance. She is determined to take out the people that killed her father. And Mercurio takes her under his wing and starts to train her and prepare her for her time in the Red Church. And so in the very first book, you see her as she 
she's being sent to the Red Church to be trained as an assassin. So there is definitely like training aspects to that story. There's definitely a school scenario. You're also getting flashbacks to the past as you find out what exactly Mia went through in her childhood and the need for vengeance just consumes her. It is her whole life. She is determined to take out the people that broke up her family, that killed her father, that imprisoned her mother and everything like that. And so that is what the first book is about. And it goes from there as she is seeking her vengeance. And y'all, I cannot even tell you the emotions that I felt while reading this book. I was very, very nervous going into this book because Jay Kristoff, kind of like George R.R. R. Martin, is not afraid to hurt you or his characters. But he is such a genius. If you've never read a Jay Kristoff, I cannot even explain to you his genius in the way that he writes and his humor, which is so fantastically self-aware. It is dark. It is dry. It is definitely my humor. That's one of the reasons why I really appreciate his stories. He wrote a young adult sci-fi series called The Illuminae Files, and that was probably one of the best reading experiences I've ever had because it was told entirely in mixed media format and it was just so solid and so well done. And now this, which is very much an adult fantasy, very, very adult in the content here, in the violence, in the gruesomeness, in the sex, all of that stuff is very, very adult in here. But there are definitely some similarities running between the books just in terms, like I said, of his humor and just his talent and the way to create an engaging story full of amazing characters that you just can't help but love and root for. And you root for Mia Corberry, my friends. She is ruthless. She's willing to do whatever she has to do and she is strong. You know, she is only 18, 19 years old in this story and she has seen some shit. She has been through some shit. She's had to do some shit. And the whole journey from start to finish is absolutely phenomenal. Another great thing about Mia is she is what's called a darken. And that means she kind of has the ability to manipulate shadows. And she has a daemon that rides on her named Mr. Kindly who takes the form of a black cat. And Mr. Kindly, of course, is a very, very sassy cat. And so he is just one of the many phenomenal characters that is throughout this story. And you find out what it means to be darken, why Mia is a darken, all of those answers come out in here, answers that you have been waiting throughout the entire series to find out. And the way that Jay Kristoff answered those questions, the way that he was able to bring her character to resolution was so phenomenal, so clever, so creative, so amazing. I was more than invested. And I was just sitting there listening to this, finishing it on my lunch break, sobbing. Tears were streaming down my face, not just because of what happened in the story, but because I knew I was going to be saying goodbye to these characters. Like I'm getting teary just thinking about the ending of this story. And I just loved what he did with these characters. And I just love this series in general. Like I cannot sing the praises of this series enough. It is by far one of my favorite series of all time. And I cannot recommend this enough. If you feel like you can handle the content in here, if you are looking for a brilliant adult fantasy, The Nevernight Chronicles by Jay Kristoff is the one that I'm going to recommend hands down. This series has my whole entire heart and soul. And needless to say, this was an easy five stars. And not only was it an easy five stars, it is now my favorite book so far of 2023. All right. And then the final book that I have to talk to you about today was one that I actually read on a whim. I was looking into planning for some upcoming challenge prompts and then for Slayer Fest and I needed recommendations for paranormal romances because I have basically given up on any paranormal romance series that I started like the Anita Blake series, the Mercy Thompson series, the Black Dagger Brotherhood, things like that. None of those books did anything for me. There's just nothing substantial enough for me to want to continue reading in them and so I wanted to see if I could find a strong paranormal romance series that I could start, want to continue with because it would also help me satisfy quite a few reading challenges that I have up coming. And somebody recommended the Psy Changeling series by Nalini Singh, the first book in that series being Slave to Sensation. So this is a story set in a futuristic world. It's not terribly futuristic. I believe it's set in 2079. And in this world, you have three primary races. You have humans, just like you and me. You also have changelings. So these are people who can turn into animals like leopards, wolves, things of that nature. And you also have what are known as the Psy. The Psy don't consider themselves human, but they look like humans and things like that. Psy are very cerebral. They all have some kind of mental superpower, for lack of a better word. They're not really considered superpowers in this story, but they have things like telekinesis and things like that. And all of the Psy are connected together via the Psy net, which is an internal mental network that connects all of them. And one thing that's really important to know about the Psy is that they have ultimately trained themselves over generations to not feel emotions. They are entirely logical beings. And if you do feel emotions as a Psy, you are considered defective. You are considered broken and you are subject to what's called rehabilitation, which is basically where they take you and they rehabilitate you and you're kind of like a vegetable the whole remainder of your life, right? And so our main character in this story is Sasha. She is a Psy, but she also feels emotion. But because of her race, she is not able to actually outwardly feel that. So she has spent her whole life trying to figure out how to keep her emotions in and how to prevent other Psy from realizing that she is defective. So that naturally takes up a lot of mental and physical energy. And in this story, 
where you're following her as she is working with Lucas Hunter, who is a changeling. He is the alpha of a local leopard pack. He and Sasha are working on this housing development that will benefit both changelings and Psy. And so Sasha has to work very closely with him. And he's really excited about that because he has ulterior motives as well. There is a serial killer out there who is abducting, torturing, and raping changeling women. And they believe that a Psy is involved in that. And so Lucas is trying to get as much information as he can to figure out who is killing these women. And he is planning on using Sasha to do that. Meanwhile, Sasha herself is also expected to be a spy for the Psy, trying to figure out more about the changelings because naturally these races don't get along. They're not besties or anything like that. It's a very tentative relationship that they have. And so both of them are working their own angles. But Lucas quickly realizes that Sasha is not like other sides. Lucas can sense the difference in her and being around Lucas kind of teaches Sasha what it's like to actually feel. She's allowed to feel her emotions. She starts to trust Lucas and she starts to open up and she starts to let herself actually feel. And so naturally it becomes about the two helping each other. Sasha wants to help Lucas figure out what Sai is killing these women and she is going to do whatever she can because she wants to feel. She wants to be able to have these emotions. And Lucas is definitely opening up her world to things that she had never even known before. And then naturally, of course, it turns into a romance. One of the reasons why I did want to give this a try is because I liked the idea of the different political dynamics in this world. The Sai are definitely in charge of a lot in this world because of their mental capabilities, the fact that they don't feel anything, the fact that they are 100% rational, logic-driven creatures. They've taught themselves not to feel so that there wouldn't be these instances of serial killers that is currently happening because Psy aren't supposed to feel rage. They're not supposed to feel jealousy. They're not supposed to feel any of that. So the fact that there is a serial killer is quite the anomaly. And so I really liked the idea of these very different races, the political differences going on here, the tentative relationships between the Psy and the changelings and the humans and things of that nature. Ultimately, I found that this one was just just okay. It didn't really do a whole lot for me. There was definitely no emotional connection. I don't feel like these characters were well developed enough in order for me to have the emotional connection. There were also quite a lot of characters, especially when you are including Lucas's pack. You're introduced to all of them and you have to kind of get an idea of their background so you're not really focused on any one of them in particular. And additionally, this was very, very insta-lovey. Lucas basically decides that Sasha is his mate and she's gonna have no say about it and he's gonna do whatever it takes to protect her. And then Sasha, after, you know, she's 26 I believe in the story so after 26 years of being raised by the Psy and having to be so closed off and having to live a certain way because she's Psy. Within a very short time of being around Lucas she opens up to him she trusts him she starts to feel she starts to let him in they start to be bonded and mated for life and, and everything like that. It all happened very very quickly. This is not a long book y'all. I think this is like 300 pages. It just moved too quick. There definitely wasn't enough character development for me. There wasn't enough emotional attachment. There definitely wasn't enough time I believe for Sasha and Lucas to like feel the way that they felt about each other. So ultimately this was just a three star read for me and I won't be continuing with it. I am still probably going to try one or two other paranormal romance series to see if I like them and want to continue because like I said I do have some reading challenges that I need to satisfy with like paranormal romance and things like that but this one just didn't do it for me. So this was a random one that I picked up in March just to see if I enjoyed it and it was a three stars. It was okay. I'm definitely not going to remember anything about it in a few days probably. So it is what it is. All right y'all that is it. Those are books 26 through 30. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I talked about today and what your thoughts are. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and have a third video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.